you very much. Um, I'd like to uh, first off uh, start by thanking all of the attendees. Uh, uh, this has had pretty significant interest uh, from across the country, uh, from our partners in, with Foresight and Global Affairs Canada, particularly uh, the support that they've given to this project from the Can Export Program and the people at the Trade Commissioner's Corps. Uh, we certainly enjoyed working with them in a number of events, uh, introducing Canadian companies across the world through some of the embassies, and you'll hear more about that uh, as we go forward. Um, I'm going to hand it over now to our partner at Foresight. So Jeanette will uh, will continue for a minute or two, hand it back to me, and then we'll get fully into the program. Thank you very much. Sounds great, uh, Stephen. So thank you, everyone. Welcome. My name is Jeanette Jackson. I'm the CEO of Foresight. Uh, if you're not familiar with Foresight, uh, we're uh, we're essentially an, an ecosystem builder here in Canada for everything clean tech and climate. And so we really focus on finding innovators and ventures that are interested in solving the world's most complex climate challenges and helping them scale and launch. And we do that in collaboration with amazing partners like CMC Research. Um, it's no secret that CCUS has become a very big topic for Canada over the last couple of years, more, uh, more so over the past several months as we're seeing different companies scale up and get these large contracts. And Canada has the opportunity to position itself as a global leader in CCUS. And so the work that's been done with Foresight and my dog apparently uh, and, uh, and CMC Research, it's really bringing together information so that we can explore these opportunities as a collective and break down silos and collaborate and work together. So thank you for having us and we're excited for, for a great event. Steve, back to you. Great, thank you very much, Jeanette. Uh, I'm just gonna give a little bit about uh, CMC and then hand it over to uh, Martha Hall Finley. Uh, so CMC is an independent science-based not-for-profit. Uh, we've been at this game of CCUS for well over a decade. Uh, and we're, we're not a think tank or a, or a policy shop so much as we focus on working with the large emitters, uh, with technology developers and SMEs, uh, focusing on the development and implementation of actionable commercially viable technology. So, uh, uh, Martha, I enjoyed your talk yesterday uh, on the podcast with, uh, uh, with our friends at ARC, but it's that sort of thing is how do we actually do things that are going to make a difference. So that's our primary focus. Lots of uh, expertise in carbon capture conversion, uh, CO2 sequestration, both in the Canadian context and, uh, and globally. We do a, a lot of work with uh, technology developers and companies and users around emissions monitoring, air, soil, and water, uh, particularly in the areas of methane right now, which is, uh, is a major issue in a number of our industries. We also do, as you'll see from uh, listening to uh, Rachel and the team, some of the work on strategy and advisory services. Um, so I'm not gonna go into any much more detail because you're here for the contents of the presentation. Uh, but again, I'd like to welcome everybody. And uh, now it's my pleasure to introduce Martha Hall Finley. Uh, she's gonna be our keynote speaker to kick this event off. Uh, Martha is uh, the Chief Sustainability Officer at, uh, at Suncor. Um, and I've known Martha for a few years and I can tell you she is a very accomplished, amazing person and personality. Uh, she's just an, a tremendous person. Um, so I'll, I'll try and uh, I'll be very quick in the interest of time, uh, but give a bit of background. Uh, uh, if you Google Martha, you can spend uh, a few hours looking at her background, but I'll just go to the high points. So prior to joining Suncor, uh, she was the CEO of the Canada West Foundation, uh, doing a lot of work in the areas of, of trade and policy. Uh, she's also served as a member of parliament from Ontario. She's a respected commentator uh, not just in Canada, but internationally on issues of public policy, trade and the environment, both in English and in French. So uh, we're, we're very happy to have her join us. I think this is an English event though, so we'll probably stick to that. Uh, should by way of background also mention, uh, she has been a medal winning ski racer, an entrepreneur, a corporate executive, uh, with a very strong background in international trade and law. Uh, I think also to the point for this discussion, she's currently a member of the Minister of 
International Trade Expert Advisory Council. So Martha, if I can hand it over to you, uh, because we're here to hear from you right now and looking forward to that. Thank you so very much. Um, well, gosh, uh, thank you, Steve. And I didn't think you were gonna go down the skiing route. I just, you know, you can, the gray hair makes it obvious that was a very long time ago. <laughs> um, but thank you very much for that kind introduction. And, uh, and thanks so much for the invitation to speak today and, and uh, to you, Stephen, and, and to CMC Research. Um, let me just, uh, a couple of brief things about Suncor. Uh, one of the things I've discovered on joining Suncor, which I did um, a little over a year ago, right before COVID hit, as you can imagine, a fairly interesting first year of a new job. Um, but uh, a lot of people actually don't really realize all of what Suncor does. So Suncor is Canada's largest integrated energy company. We are an oil sands company. I often say to people, especially outside of our, our world, yes, I am the chief sustainability officer for an oil sands company. And I let that sink in just for a bit. Um, you can imagine in some parts of the world like Europe and um, that seen as a as an oxymoron. So that just opens up for some some greater conversation. But Suncor, yes, we produce oil, and um, uh, we upgrade it, we refine it, we distribute it, we sell at retail. We are also Petro Canada. Um, we operate offshore on the east coast of Canada, but also uh, Norway and the United Kingdom. We uh, have operations globally in, in terms of refining. We refine in the United States as well. Um, so we have a really interesting perspective, I think, on the, on the larger energy mix. We have also been in wind power for 20 years. We are heavily into, well, heavily being really interested in, certainly our big business is still oil, but very interested in, in um, have been investing significantly in biofuels, but but interestingly enough, not not just biofuels that takes trees, for example. Um, Enerchem is one of our investments, and uh, one of the things that's really interesting about Enerchem is it is it, it 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 uses actually municipal waste, so it's a very interesting part of a much more circular economy, which I think is very interesting. Some of you will have have heard also. Um, investments in Lanza Tech, Lanza Jet for jet fuel, sustainable jet fuel, which would be very interesting. That's a global consortium, um, uh, but also very interested in CCUS. And I'm, I'm going to get the CCUS in in a minute. Um, but one of the thing, one of the things I want to say just to start. I mean, this is Canadian clean tech clean tech innovation uh, on the world stage. How do we export what we do? Now, as Suncor, we already export a lot of what we do in the form of oil. Um, but how do we export our expertise? How do we export the knowledge that we've developed in clean tech? Before I go there, I want to just a little bit of a pet, a pet peeve. Anytime somebody says, or anytime somebody talks about the tech industry, I get a bit frustrated because they say there isn't a tech industry. And let me explain, because I know a lot of people on the call will go, she's nuts. Let me explain. Technology over centuries has been what we develop as humans, what we innovate, what we develop, what we invent to do what we do more effectively, more efficiently, right? Even Uber, a massive tech company was developed. That technology allows us to do something, get around when we don't have our own car, more effectively, more efficiently. It's not to take away from the importance of it. It's just to put things into context of when we talk about what we can export, we need to be really, I think we need to be really objective about what that is. So if I go to clean tech and you all know, or should know that the oil and gas industry in Canada is by far the biggest investor in what we call clean tech. But there are a couple of aspects of clean tech, right? Um, to my point earlier, it's what we do with that technology. And there are two main areas of what we refer to as clean tech. One is new technology that, or, or rather new energy sources. So wind, solar, 
Um, hydro is obviously not new, um, but certainly there are technologies going into how we do even hydroelectricity more effectively, how we transmit it more effectively. And as I said, Suncor has been in the wind business for 20 years. Personally, I've been a solar power user for over 20 years. Huge fan. Don't really know why every rooftop doesn't have solar panels. Um, that's a whole other conversation, I know. Um, but uh, those, are, those are technologies that provide cleaner, or, and I, I wouldn't say clean, clean, but cleaner energy, right? Then there are also the clean technologies that allow us to do the other things that we do, but reduce the emissions associated with them. Needless to say, that's very interesting for Suncor because we're an oil company, right? And, I, and, and, and just as an aside, you know, you have all these people talking about net zero by 2050 and you have all these companies. And I, and I keep going back to, you know, um, there's, a, there's a reason Suncor has not yet, has not committed to a net zero by 2050 target. That's because we're already seeing some um, pushback. We're already seeing people criticizing global oil companies for greenwashing in saying that. We're already seeing pushback from some investors saying, yeah, but you know, saying something isn't the same thing as doing. And at Suncor, for those of you who, for those of you who know the company, has a, has a real track record of, um, of being pretty honest and transparent. And you know, we've, we've been disclosing our report on sustainability has been you know, years we've been doing that. We've won awards in terms of disclosure. Um, I wouldn't have joined the company if I hadn't known uh, the reputation for that kind of, you know, principled integrity. So for us, it's not that we don't know where we need to go as a globe. It's not that we don't know where we need to go as a country, and it's not that we don't know where we need to go as a sector. It's just really, really important to us that we say, look, Microsoft, who, who's done some awesome things in terms of net zero by 2050, a um, little harder for an oil company. Not only are we a big emitter in Canada for our processes and how we get the oil, although we're not the dirtiest, just to be clear, um, and we're rapidly becoming um, cleaner uh, per barrel um, over time, which is also very exciting. People are going to focus on absolutes, right? And, and you know, my answer is uh, it's not only the emissions that are created when we produce what we produce, we produce oil. That's an issue, right? 80% of the emissions associated with a barrel of oil um, are associated with when it actually gets combust, combusted. So as a sector, as a company, as a sector, it simply isn't as easy for us to say, sure, we'll be net zero by 2050. It's gonna take a lot of work. And for Suncor, it's really important to us that we know how we're going to do that that we know what are the barriers, what are the factors, what are the things that are going to re be required for us to actually be able to do that. It's very important for us to have a much better handle on that before we go out and say what we're going to do. Um, so we'll come, I come back to the clean tech associated with reducing emissions for the things that we already do. <clears throat> and now I'm gonna focus on reducing emissions on uh, reducing emissions that, that, that we are the cause of when we produce our oil. I'm not gonna focus on the emissions when the oil is, is uh, uh, combusted in your cars and your trucks, okay? So just a, a bit of focus. That brings me to CCUS. It's not the only technology out there that might reduce, help reduce emissions associated with what we do. I'll touch on a couple, you know, small modular nuclear, for example. I mean, imagine Canada has an incredible history in that regard in terms of safety, in terms of regulatory uh, uh, respect, uh, capability, and then, and then global respect. So it's a big opportunity for this country. And can you imagine an oil sands company or a group of oil sands? Can you imagine if we had a technology like small modular that could, in fact, allow us to, to extract and process our oil? at zero emissions. Now that, now that would be interesting. We would go from being the bad boy, which let's acknowledge, you know, oil sands have, have that reputation. I might, it's not deserved, but there you go. But we have that to go from there to being um, what we would hope is a, a preferred source of oil globally. Um, not only is that good for us, but that's awesome for Canada. And so for sure, we're looking at those options. 
not tomorrow, as we know. Some of these technologies will not happen tomorrow. Our, our you know, uh, collective research into solvents, our collective research into a variety of things that can help us in the field. You know, um, uh, autonomous haul trucks. Yeah, there's there's still trucks, but they use way less uh, fuel when you don't have drivers having to stop and start. And it's actually very cool uh, technology. So CCUS. Everybody on this call knows that there is great interest in CCUS, um, certainly from our perspective. And some of you would know we're in the oil sands, we're, we're working together. And I think the collaboration is really important because if you have one-off projects, it's not gonna be effective. It's not gonna be economic. But CCUS generally is not economic. Let's be clear, there's some, uh, some of these technologies that could turn into money-making ventures. CCUS, not so clear right now. Uh, it, it, you know, what we're looking at now is, um, at first blush, certainly just a cost. Um, doesn't mean we're not looking at it, but we have to, we have to, in collaboration with other companies, in collaboration with governments, in collaboration internationally, because we can't pretend that this is this stops at the border. Um, look at the things that encourage the, the financing required to actually build some of these projects. Um, but we're looking at it really seriously. And the reason we're doing that is one, it's proven. We know it works. We've, we know, for example, in Canada, we have a couple of great examples, as folks on the call already know, bound, starting with Boundary Dam, but then you look at, in the oil sands, the Quest project, we know it works. We know it's still really expensive, um, but it is clearly right now the lowest, biggest hanging fruit, if you will, to address significant emission reductions um, for, a, for a sector and a country where we have a very high per capita uh, um, uh, level of emissions. And, you know, let me be fair and, and, and you know, for the global affairs people and anybody else from the government of Canada, don't take this the wrong way, but if you look at our history of making commitments, whether it's Kyoto, whether it's you know uh, the original um, uh, Paris Agreement, um, our track record hasn't been that good in actually fulfilling those promises or meeting those targets. My sense, and I think this is a really good thing, is that this time is different. There is a really big recognition that it's not just political targets. We all know we have to do this. And that I think is, a. am not sure that was the case before, but I really feel that way now, which means that there's a much greater level of, a, a much greater opportunity for collaboration. And I've often said that I think one of the things that we've seen from COVID, one of the benefits, one of the few uh, in, a, in a whole series of challenges is a greater recognition of the importance of collaboration. And I, and I mean collaboration of all kinds, collaboration among uh, companies. We're seeing certainly in the oil sands, huge collaboration right now, specifically with respect to CCUS and potentially other technologies that can help us collectively reduce our emissions. But collaboration with government. So the Alberta government, collaboration with the federal government. Uh, you, you can imagine we're in heavy discussions with the federal government about Okay, we're a big emitter, oil sands. We're a really kind of big part of the Canadian challenge here. Um, we're not gonna shut down. There might be a few people who wanted to do that, but that's not gonna happen. So what's the next best way for us to be a part of the solution? Well, it's to actually recognize that we're potentially and should be a really, really big part of the solution. We're part of the challenge. We're a big part of the solution and, and should be and want to be. So how do we collaborate more effectively with the federal government? How do we collaborate more effectively with other organizations like the Canada Infrastructure Bank? Um, that's happening. And I have to say, I mean, Stephen mentioned that I spent some time in politics. Um, for better, for worse, I did spend some time in politics. But I, I have to say that I am hearing far greater levels of desire for collaboration, far greater levels of, okay, this is not so much a partisan thing as it is, this, some people all, will still always do that. But there's a much greater sense of, this is not a partisan issue. This is a challenge we face globally. This is a challenge we face as a country. 
This is something we need to be working together on, which I think is fantastic. And I, and I tell you, even in the last year or two, I'm sensing a much greater level of that willingness, that desire, that recognition that we need to collaborate. So collaboration between companies, collaborations between sectors. So the collaborations that we have, yes, Mike, I mentioned Microsoft, we, we do some really neat stuff with them. But um, when you're looking at scopes one and two, but then you're also looking at scope three, you're looking at all of your suppliers, you're looking at your customers. How do we actually collaborate more? Because let's be honest, we supply stuff that the world is demanding. Um, demand is, is actually the key here. So how do we actually work with customers to, re to reduce or change demand for some of the energies that are more polluting? All of that is really, really good. I'm just gonna come back now to CCUS because that's obviously the, the discussion here. Um, it's not going to be easy. The examples we have prove the technology, but they've also proven the cost. If we look at other countries around the world, Norway, the United Kingdom, even Saudi Arabia, huge investments by government, whether directly by government or indirectly by tax approaches. Norway is the, the number of things that Norway does engaging their taxpayers in this part, in this effort is, is really quite something um, impressive. Um, but without that kind of investment, this stuff doesn't happen. It's just, you know, it may bother some people that business has to actually earn a profit, but business has to earn a profit. Otherwise, we, we, we don't operate. And if we don't operate, we don't generate the revenue. We don't employ the 30 some thousand people that we do. We don't, you know, so all of those things are really important. Um, so how do we get CCUS? How do we fit that into the mix? Well, there's no question we're going to need a significant level of, um, of uh, government, private sector, other organization in even Canadian um, uh, public engagement and collaboration on this. And it's not going to be cheap. Ask the Norwegians, ask the Brits, ask anybody else. It's not cheap. But if we're going to, if we're going to do this and we're going to meet our Paris commitments as a country, we're going to have to, we're going to have to pony up. We're going to have to do that, all of us. Um, so how, what does that look like and how do we do it? Um, I know that's not the, the topic specifically here, but it then feeds into where I want to finish off. And that is, how do we do what we do? One, to address those fundamental issues, reduction of, of global greenhouse gas emissions, and how do we do it in a way that works economically? We're, gonna, we're working really hard on that, and, and I'm confident we'll figure it out. Um, we do need to look at other jurisdictions because other jurisdictions are stepping up more, frankly, more quickly, and more strongly than Canada has done so far. Um, Canada has, but you know, we're really good at patting ourselves on the back, but I really encourage people here to go and look at what other countries are doing. Um, uh, I've, I've mentioned Norway a couple of times. If you look at the, the long ship effort, the Northern Lights effort, there's some really cool innovations happening there. Um, those happen because of big significant investments, public and private. Um, my warning is that we want to be able to play in this. We want to be a leader. We want, and when I say we, I'm I'm talking as a Canadian now. Stephen knows I'm the, like I that's 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 my thrust in all of this is is how can we do this as a country? And um, I just worry that we get complacent. And we say, I hear this every day. Oh yeah, we're, we're world leaders in CCUS. I, I, I think we have been. I'm not so sure we are. And I'm pretty confident we won't be if we don't take the, the major investment and collaboration steps that we need to, to be able to take us to that next step. Um, uh, so that's just a bit of a, 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 a caution um, and, and an encouragement to look around at what's really happening around the world so that we can determine where are the gaps that Canada can, can, what are the gaps that Canada can fill? What are the things that we have learned in our CCUS or CCS, however you want to describe, what have we learned in our CCS 
um, efforts to date that are different from what other people in other countries have done? And how do we encourage continued learning and continued building on that so that we can innovate and continue to innovate in ways that are export in, in technological innovations that we can then export to the rest of the world? I think this is a huge opportunity for us, but my caution is that I'm already sensing a bit of complacency. Um, I, I hear all the time, oh, Canada is a world leader in clean tech. Um, you know, I will remind everybody, yes, huge investment by the oil and gas company, companies and oil and gas sector has encouraged that, that level of innovation and that level of, of, of invention and development. But we can't be complacent. Um, I think there's a major opportunity, but it's going to take a lot of work. It's going to take a lot of investment. Um, on, on the part of everybody, governments, provincial governments, federal governments, um, Canadians by way of tax measures, by, you know, we even if we look at the 45Q arrangement in the United States, Canada's tax system is not the same. So we can't, people have said, oh, we need a 45Q regime here in Canada. Well, it's not so easy. It's a little more complicated here. But if you look at how 45Q um, acts and you look at the results, I mean, more and more people are building CCS, CCUS infrastructure in the United States, very directly associated with the 45Q uh, opportunities. It's, it's money. It's, it's flexibility in being able to use that money. It's, um, you know, we, we find people here and talk about, well, we can use a tax credit and you go, okay, if Canada wants to be a laggard, then, you know, don't keep up with the United States. But if we want to compete in this space, we need to look at what's happening. I can't emphasize this enough. We need to look at what's happening around us. And with the Biden administration now in the United States, 45Q is going to become even more uh, generous is, 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 I don't like that word, but more effective. Um, we have a long way to go in Canada to be able to meet that kind of uh, incentive if we really want to attract and build the infrastructure that we need to build. Um, so all of that, it's a bit of a warning. It's a bit of an encouragement. Um, I just want to finish on a higher note, if I can. And it's, um, I was going to just end there. But I was just on a, on a panel discussion this morning with a bunch of folks in my uh, industry from around the world. And one of the really neat topics was our difficulty in attracting talent. Well, we're an oil sands company. We're oil and gas as a sector. Not exactly, you know, what high school students or university students are saying, yeah, I want to go and work in the oil sands or I want to go and work at, 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 in oil. What I think is a really neat opportunity is moving from what are you doing in terms of your clean, and this goes back to my comment about there are two, uh, two parts of clean tech. One is new energy sources, wind, solar, nuclear, really interesting stuff going on, of course, there. But there's also how do we reduce emissions from the stuff we're already doing? And that is a huge opportunity for us. And for young people, and I say this because I know so many of you either are or work with people who are wondering uh, what to do in order to really affect change and really contribute, there's some real and some really interesting opportunities in getting in engaged with those people who are working at reducing the emissions for the things that we, that we already do. Big reductions are possible, and those reductions are going to have a significant effect on not only what we're able to do, but what Canada is able to do in terms of meeting our Paris uh, commitments. That I think could be really attractive um, as long as we explain to people that that's exactly what we're doing. And, and hopefully I just helped a little bit in doing that and you know, no pressure, but spread the word. We have some really interesting things going on and we're only gonna be able to do that if we collaborate um, all of us together. So. A little bit of little bit of winging it at the end there, Stephen. But uh, but I hope I hope I I put a few things on the table there for you. Thank thank you so much. And I, I just like to uh, kind of reiterate a few of you things you said to the audience. Uh, having built businesses and been an entrepreneur, the most important thing that you have to look for is demand and the big buyers. And you made it very clear. This industry is the biggest buyer of clean tech in Canada. 
You have a footprint as well in Norway and the UK who are big leaders in this area. So I, I you know, just encourage everybody to, to really think at all those companies that have ideas and are working on projects, et cetera, is really, we need to be making the connections with Suncor and others. That's what you need to solve the problem is, uh, is actually having the solutions, the technology as you described it. So really appreciate that. The one other thing I really wanted to jump on there was the Q45, not getting into details, but I think as Canadians, you know, we are attracting young people into this area of CCUS and others. It's exciting and people want to make a difference. Um, but we also have to encourage our governments to support this in a positive way. And just simply, simply punishing different groups is not going to work. Let's look at what works around the world, as you said. So I appreciate that. Hopefully there's some more discussion in the breakout sessions. And thank you so much, as always. It's just always great to, to, to get your wisdom. And I'm going to hand it over to Brian pretty quick, uh, who's taking the next part of this. But again, thanks a lot, Martha. Thank you so much. Well, thanks, Stephen. And I see there are a couple of questions in the chat. I'll try and answer them separately now while I listen to, to the rest of the program. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Martha. Uh, and, and that was truly an inspiration uh, and uh, look forward to hearing more from, uh, from you and from Sancor down the, down the road. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Brian Meller, Director of Programs and Partnerships at CMC Research Institutes and excited to introduce our next two speakers. Uh, Rachel Shin, uh, our Senior Manager of Strategy and Research at CMC and David Sanguinetti, Vice President of Technology at Foresight, uh, are going to give you a review of the International Business Development Strategy. After their presentations, you'll have an opportunity to ask questions uh, using the chat function. Uh, after this last year of heavy Zoom use, uh, we've all engaged and I'm sure everyone needs no further instructions on how to do that. The International Business Development Strategy has been a long time coming. Canada is known as a country of great innovation and our work in CCUS is no exception. We have a well-deserved repu reputation for excellence in the field, uh, but as Martha said, still have a long way to go in terms of being able uh, to seize this global opportunity. Four of the world's largest CCS facilities are in Canada. We have three finalists in the Energy COSIA Carbon X Prize, and we have a string of world-class research and development facilities uh, running across the country with purpose-built infrastructure for CCUS testing and development. We're seeing Canadian CCUS success stories emerging on the international scene through investment, strategic partnerships, and direct sales. And clearly, there is expertise uh, and made in Canada technology that we can sell to the world. That's where this international business development strategy comes in. The purpose of, of this document is to provide an actionable resource for CCUS companies to move beyond our borders to seize international markets. I'd like to acknowledge the support of the Canadian Trade Commissioner Service and thank our international advisory panel uh, that included Phil DeLuna, John Lofhead, Eddie Chu, Jason Switzer, Brett Henkel, Guy Jensi, Yvonne Grunthaler, and Jeff Nichols. And so without for, uh, further delay, let's have Rachel and David share, share the findings. Over to you. Hi everyone, thanks uh, Brian for that introduction. Um, my name is Rachel Shin, as um, Brian mentioned in the introduction. Um, I'm a manager at CMC Research Institutes. Um, so today we're happy to announce the release of our international business development strategy for Canadian carbon capture, utilization and conversion uh, and storage technologies. Um, so we'll be releasing an English version of the strategy today on CMC and Foresight's websites with a French version to, to be released shortly as well. Um, before proceeding, I'd also like to thank and acknowledge the support from Global Affairs Canada Can Export Associations program that allowed us to complete this work. Uh, next slide, please. So in terms of purpose, Brian gave a brief introduction, but I'll expand on it a little more. Um, so as we all know, in recent years, we've seen growing global action on climate change. Governments are imposing low carbon policies, industries are announcing net zero targets, and investors are supporting new technologies that provide decarbonization pathways. All of these shifts have stimulated a global race to develop technologies and reduce carbon, especially in hard to decarbonize industries like steel, cement, oil, and gas. 
So this is really promising, promising news because not only is development of these technologies necessary to mitigate climate change, but it also prevents a really lucrative business opportunity and one that Canada can be well positioned to take advantage of. Current estimates place the market for low carbon technologies and products at $1 trillion by 2030, uh, reiterating what, what a big opportunity this is. Um, but it's not necessarily super easy to access. It can be challenging for a small startup with staff already working to capacity to find the time to research these markets in it and then develop a business plan to make contacts for export. So recognizing this challenge, this challenge, CMC Research and Foresight set out um, this uh, path to develop a strategy that would help CCUS Canadian technology companies develop strategies to access these markets. Um, so as per our slide here, um, the report's purpose is to identify key international markets, um, which David will uh, go into shortly, and also provide actionable information and evidence to support Canadian SMEs in accessing um, these export markets. Next slide, please. Uh, one back. So in terms of our approach, um, what we did, we started by taking a broad look at the global industrial market, CCUS activity, and government policy uh, with, an, uh, with a literature review and interviews with key stakeholders. Um, this provided us with enough information to narrow down our focus down to five target countries. While there are other countries with strong markets, uh, we selected these five because they were strong in the following factors, enabling policy, a public willingness to accept CCUS technologies, suitability of the country's industrial sector, um, for example, um, hubs of, of industrial emissions, and a capacity for geological storage. And David will be uh, delving into the, the countries that we focused on shortly. Um, after narrowing our focus to the target countries, we further investigated market opportunities for Canadian CCUS technologies um, for export uh, by conducting further interviews investigating policies, looking at different funding mechanisms available in these uh, international markets, and identifying potential opportunities and threats in each region. One area that we found was particularly um, uh, fruitful for us was building out two case studies of Canadian companies that have successfully planned and entered international markets. Uh, we'll be sharing those findings um, shortly, but that's also included in the report. Um, a key part of our approach was also assembling an expert advisory panel with representatives from Canada and internationally to test our findings and ask for recommendations and comments to guide us in our approach. So this was critical again in just steering our overall uh, direction and also establishing contacts for this project. Next slide, please. So I'll now dive into the overarching strategy recommendations. Um, so one thing that's important to note is that this strategy is not specific to one company, rather it's a strategy for the Canadian CCUS sector. Um, and what we recommend is that companies that are using this look at it and use it as evidence to develop their own targeted international business development strategies. Um, we recommend you begin um, your export planning by completing a strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and threats assessment. Um, SMEs should evaluate their technology to identify what its unique strengths and weaknesses are, um, and then can identify relevant opportunities and threats uh, external to the technology, many of which are identified in this report that you'll see. Um, completing a SWOT will help use this information in the report to narrow down to a few target markets for export that are relevant for your technology. We also recommend you connect with the Federal Trade Commissioner Service. They're a really valuable resource in connecting with your target markets and identifying relevant key contacts for you. Um, in our breakout sessions coming next, we have a couple trade commissioners on hand to talk about some of the services. Um, so in terms of a third step um, is developing your own plan to, uh, for market entry pathways. Um, there are multiple ways to enter a market, including exporting, franchising, developing partnerships with local firms, um, or the launch of a wholly owned subsidiary. Uh, David will be touching shortly on the differences uh, in suggested market uh, entry pathways um, shortly. 
Uh, in Norway, for example, however, uh, we found in-country representation as recommended due to the close-knit business relationship structure. But in the US, for example, exporting might be a more viable strategy. So again, just reiterating one approach won't, won't work for all markets. Um, it's also important to connect with the local champion in your target market. A champion is not necessarily a business partner, but someone with a strong understanding of the local market who is willing to help you forge new relationships. Um, and there are different ways to find these uh, connections. In the report, we provide different names um, and contacts as a starting point for you. Uh, another way to learn more about specific markets and make connections is to participate in conferences or regional workshops. Many of these are currently online um, due to the situation we all find ourselves in now, unfortunately, but um, they're still uh, very useful in forging new relationships and provide networking um, time with, with international potential partners. Um, we have uh, Appendix C in the report that has a list of different events and workshops that we recommend you uh, investigating. Um, social acceptability also uh, factors into some of the target markets we've identified. Um, negative perceptions uh, can influence acceptance in, in regions. So it's important to work with local champions to identify if any of that is relevant to your technology and might inhibit export. Um, it's also important to understand the policy environment of your target regions. Um, some regions have more enabling CCUS policy or prohibitive policy. Um, and ultimately that can influence the uptake of your technology. Um, SME should also identify the industrial emissions landscape of the target re regions that you're investigating. So for example, if your technology is geared for cement factories, you should be taking steps to identify major cement production hubs. Um, so this, this might seem uh, fairly straightforward, but I think um, what we've heard over and over from industries is that um, it's so important for technology companies to really do their homework um, and really have that evidence and, and research into um, their approach for identifying suitable target markets. Uh, so this strategy document is ultimately uh, intended to help you do that. Um, finally, SMEs should leverage um, successful CCUS export story learnings. So the report highlights case studies from two companies, Svante and Carbon Cure. Uh, Carbon Cure, some of the, the key findings, they stress the importance of um, protecting your intellectual property and the need to build brand recognition uh, in develop, to develop market outreach. Um, Svante told us that the TCS can provide valuable connections in the community and recommended focusing on hub regions to narrow business development efforts and developing partnerships with multiple collaborators is also really important. So there's much more um, from these two companies and, and in the strategy in general, but uh, for now, I'll leave it there and pass it to David, who will discuss findings in our five key countries. Thank you, Rachel. So as Rachel has highlighted, our focus here is on Canadian SMEs. Uh, and we're presenting to those SMEs uh, an a lot of information on how you as a small company can create a strategy to take your technology out into the world. Uh, and it's really important to understand that you're not gonna take it to the entire world. Uh, you need to pick one or two countries to target. And a lot of what we're talking about here is how do you pick which country uh, you're going to? So if I can get the, the next slide. Uh, so I'm going to start with Australia. Australia is the first of the five countries, and it's first because it starts with A. Uh, this is an alphabetical list. It's not a ranking because, as already highlighted by Rachel, you need to identify your company's strengths and weaknesses and see how they match against the opportunities and threats in individual regions in individual countries. So what do we know about Australia? Unlike many other countries that we looked at, the real drive for CCUS in Australia is industry. It's not government regulation so much, but Australian industry has seen a phenomenal opportunity in blue hydrogen, uh, and they are looking at ways to leverage that. And a key aspect of blue hydrogen, as I'm sure you all realize, is you need to ca capture the carbon. Uh, there are a couple of big hubs in Australia, uh, and definitely if you wanna get in uh, 
to work in Australia, try to partner up with people who are working in those hubs. Uh, it's also worth understanding in Australia that the um, the government or uh, sorry the industry approach is a little bit different in that you can similar to the US actually export your technology Rachel mentioned that you know many times you need to partner up uh, or uh, set up a, a uh, a subsidiary in a particular location. That's not the case so much with Australia, which is uh, beneficial in a lot of ways. Uh, it's definitely a plus to working in Australia. Uh, but having said that, you still need some sort of connection in. Uh, you'll hear us say this many times, but talking to the, the local TCS, uh, have them introduce you to the right folks. So if we can get the next slide, please. So big contrast here from Australia to Germany, because although Australia definitely has a storage focus in Germany, it's quite the opposite. Uh, there is no social license whatsoever for carbon capture and storage in Germany. They don't want to store their CO2. They are quite happy, however, to capture it and utilize it. And that's of great significance when you realize that Germany is the largest industrial emitter in Europe. So they've got a problem and they know they have to deal with it and industry knows they have to deal with it. So this actually creates a phenomenal opportunity if you're a company that has carbon utilization technology. And there's two aspects to this that I really want to highlight. First off, there's a massive need and therefore a pull. And when you're looking for a target market, you want to find a target market that wants your technology and that needs your technology. The other aspect of it is that if you partner up with really big industry who really value your technology uh, and you structure that partnership correctly, uh, and definitely there are opportunities with German companies to do this, not only are you exporting to Germany, but you can partner up with them to all of the countries that they export to. So when you look at the big uh, car uh, cement companies in Germany, the big chemical manufacturers that are based in Germany, you partner up with them, you work with them initially in Germany, they then would love to uh, capitalize on your technology and give you the benefit of that uh, as they export it to the rest of the world. So phenomenal opportunity there in Germany, um, but it needs to be right for you. So match your technologies against their, comp their issues. And if it's a good fit, uh, definitely Germany is a great place to go. Next slide, please. So we've heard a, a lot about Norway already from Martha Hall Finley, uh, and there's a reason why she was uh, highlighting them. Norway has arguably a government strategy that says they want to be the world experts in CCUS, particularly starting with storage. Uh, but nice to know about them, they are open to bringing in other technologies. Uh, also already uh, highlighted uh, by Rachel, you shouldn't just export your technology to Norway. They're not going to really be interested in that. You are going to have to set up either a local partnership or a subsidiary in Norway. You need to understand the business culture there and you need to have a local presence. But if you take the time to do that, they are actively looking for technologies. They want to have all the best technologies in the world there in Norway. And if you have something that they don't have, they're really interested in it. Uh, and you can go there uh, and take advantage of that opportunity. Uh, it is also a great company, a great country, I should say, for doing business in. Uh, and there's lots of money available from the government to support uh, CCS and CCU technologies with the caveat that you need to be a Norwegian company. So either partner up with a Norwegian company that can get that funding or create a subsidiary there. Next slide, please. So the United Kingdom, what stands out about the UK is that in 2019, they put in a law, and this wasn't government regulation, this was a law that said they're going to be net zero by 2050. And they knew full well when they started that, that they didn't actually know how to do it. And so they have taken on a overall countrywide strategy of saying, 
how do we do this? How do we find the right technology? So unlike any other country that we looked at, the UK has representatives here in Canada who are actively looking for our technology. That's not to say that like to the US or Australia, you can simply export over the border. No, they, they do want you to come and partner up there, but they actively want you to. They are here, they are looking for uh, Canadian technology, both storage, uh, a focus on blue hydrogen, and uh, to a lesser extent, but not a non-zero extent, they're also interested in utilization. Another thing to really understand about the UK is their hub strategy. Lots of people are talking about clusters and hubs and uh, ourselves included, there's a lot of benefits to them. Uh, and the UK has really narrowed it down. They've got five uh, and the, each of the five has a different focus. So take some time, uh, review each of those five. You can talk to the UK folks here. They're both UK and Scotland because uh, um, some of that work is being done in Scotland. They have their representatives here uh, and they will be really happy to talk to you and they will explain to you what those different hubs are, what their focuses are and who to partner with there. And when you understand you need to partner, you'll need to, you know, similar to Norway, you'll need to have uh, a local presence there. Also understand that there's money available. And in the UK, that money is available, not just from the government, but also from industry. They are very keen to move. I am aware of a number of Canadian CCUS companies that have had some success exporting their technology to the UK by setting up uh, a local partnership. Uh, phenomenal opportunity there and I really encourage you to explore it, check to see if it's a good fit for you because great opportunities. Next slide, please. So now we move to the United States. I think everybody is on the call is probably aware that the US is our largest trading partner. And you also have probably heard about the 45Q. It's been uh, mentioned on uh, this webinar a few times. And it, as soon as you go digging into uh, CCUS literature, everybody's talking about it because it is a very powerful financial incentive. As a result, there are many Canadian companies that have taken advantage of that. I wanna flag, however, that if you go digging a little deeper, you'll find that all that activity is not spread evenly across the US. Because similar to Canada, state by state legislation uh, and policies and incentives uh, really are driving what happens where. So we actually highlight four different states inside the US uh, that we found were really driving the work. Uh, in CCOS. So we've got California, New York, Texas, and Louisiana. And similar to uh, my uh, earlier comments about the fact that each country is different, well, each of those states is very different. Uh, New York, for example, uh, they have actually do have some storage potential, but they have as a state decided that their focus is on utilization and they are putting a lot of effort and money into supporting utilization technologies. Canadian government has partnered up with them to take advantage of that. Uh, so you can talk to our uh, trade representative there, uh, Ian Philp, I'll, I'll name him. Uh, he's been a great supporter of ours uh, and of, a, of this effort, and he can help guide you, but there is phenomenal opportunity there for utilization technologies. If storage is your game, then Texas is a really great place to go looking. Carbon capture and storage is big business in Texas. Uh, Louisiana, also very big supporter of storage, though they also do some utilization. California is doing all of the above. Uh, there is CCU technology being actively supported there. There's CCS technology. And to really highlight for California, there is a clean fuel standard that is actively encouraging people to invest both in California and even outside the state. Uh, there are mechanisms by which you can capture carbon outside of the state and other parts of the US and get credit for it in the California Clean Fuel Standard. You've probably been, if you're taking notes, been trying to, having trouble, you know, catching up and keeping up with each of these different states and who's doing what. Um, 
in addition to reading the rep report where it is all laid out in a lot more detail, I would actively encourage you to find local experts on the government policies. And this is true not just for the US, this is true for any place you're going. Find a local policy consultant. It will cost you a little bit, it will save you a lot more and likely make you uh, an awful lot more if you get it right. Uh, so in order to fully take advantage of the policies uh, and benefits in any particular region, talk to an expert pay a little bit upfront to make sure you're doing it the right way and structuring your organization and uh, targeting the regions in the right way. So I thank you for, uh, for your uh, attention and rather whirlwind tour of the, uh, the top five countries. And I'll pass it back to Rachel to run through a few of the uh, other findings that we had in, uh, in our study. Thanks, David. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so in terms of further recommendations, I um, wanted to mention other countries where markets for CCUS technology export are certainly uh, developed and continue to be developing, uh, including France, Japan, and the Netherlands. Um, the report details um, uh, these countries as well. Um, so we suggest you um, evaluate and identify uh, whether those markets are a good fit for your technologies. Um, to reiterate, it's, it's critical that your technology business model and company is the right fit for the target market that you want to enter. Um, remember that different strategies will be required for different markets, as uh, David explained in, in his section. Um, we also recommend that you avoid spreading yourself too thin, and, and perhaps you want to explore one market at a time, um, explore all the options, make connections, and um, then once that's exhausted, you know, make a decision to really pursue into the market or, or move on to alternatives. That way you'll be able to really put your best effort forward and uh, really understand one market at a time. Um, and, you know, it bears repeating that local champions are really critical in learning about and moving into export markets. Um, the Trade Commissioner uh, can help you make these connections and, and we also identified other contacts, uh, as I mentioned before, in the report. Next slide, please. So in terms of next steps, um, uh, please do stay in touch with uh, CMC Foresight Global Affairs Canada. Um, thank you so much for taking the time to learn about this strategy today. Um, we will be following up with a link to the strategy um, and we really hope that it generates great excitement and value uh, to you once you've had a chance to really uh, dive into it. Um, we'd love to hear your thoughts about the report and also to hear about your progress um, as you begin to utilize the report and, and explore new markets for your technologies. Thanks very much. Great. Thanks, Rachel and David, for that insightful overview of the IBDS and, and some of our key findings. Uh, we hope that our audience can find it useful uh, and feel free to um, ask uh, any questions to Rachel and David in the, in the chat as we uh, move forward here. Uh, but we are going to move into our next session uh, where we'll have three breakout rooms planned where we explore more deeply some best practices for technology companies seeking markets outside of Canada. So I'm now pleased to introduce our, our, our first two breakout sessions. You'll have the opportunity to self-select into one of these rooms now uh, under the following topics. Um, and um, if you're not able to do so, please um, uh, ask us in the uh, chat box and we'll move you over uh, and assign you manually. So the first breakout room is, is called Entering the Unknown, Assessing Overseas Markets. Um, you'll learn from two experts um, what steps you need to take uh, to find and enter foreign markets. Stephen Lougheed, uh, CMC CEO, has years of experience building relationships with companies in international markets. Uh, including the United Kingdom, and we'll share key steps and tips on how to assess markets and make connections. Uh, joining Stephen is uh, Al Alberta's Regional Federal Trade Commissioner uh, for Clean Tech and I, uh, in Alberta, and I have to say a longtime champion of CCUS, Yvonne Grinthaler. Uh, thank you uh, both for, for hosting breakout room number one. Uh, breakout room number two is uh, Dominique uh, Helene from Suez. Uh, Dominique is the CCUS Solutions Director at Suez, based in France. Uh, committed since the beginning of, uh, of his career in innovation and business development within the waste management sector, Dominique acquired a deep understanding of current and future technology needs 
uh, across the entire value chain from collection of waste uh, right through to uh, suitable material uh, for energy recovery and other uses. Uh, since 2016, as part of Suez Ventures team, uh, Dominique experimented uh, and experienced the terrific power of open innovation mechanisms. Uh, he focused on the selection and implementation of commercial, strategic, and technological partnerships with startups, SMEs, and industrial groups in order to integrate uh, diff different technologies and know-how to enable the transformation of their businesses in the field of resource management and recycling. He's now focused on boosting Suez to deploy massive and effective carbon to value solutions uh, that will contribute to mitigating climate change according to Paris Agreement objectives. Uh, we'll also have a third uh, breakout room uh, called Pitching the Canadian Advantage. And for a country with a relatively small population, Canada looms large in terms of innovation, especially in the fields of CCUS. Uh, the key to growing international markets in many capacities is communicating this Canadian advantage with the rest of the world. Um, please join communications expert and head of communications at CMC, Ruth Klinkhammer and Denis Trottier, Trade Commissioner uh, to the Canadian Embassy in Paris to unpack marketing strategies to tell the world why uh, folks should uh, do business in and with Canada. So please choose your preferred room and uh, uh, we'll see you back here in about 20 minutes. Everybody and, and Dominique, I, I really enjoyed your, uh, your talk and, and very interesting to hear uh, the, the perspective that, uh, uh, that Suez is taking on this. So I hope everyone else had, uh, had really uh, fruitful discussions and, and uh, uh, enjoyed that. Um, so for our last session here, we're going to hear uh, from two industry representatives who have been working with uh, small technology companies. Lafarge Wholesome and Capital Power have been working with small companies to pilot and develop technologies. Uh, they have solid reasons for doing so. Um, SMEs are often working on cutting edge technologies that can provide industries with innovative solutions uh, that they don't necessarily have to develop in house. SMEs also offer investment opportunities uh, for large industrial industrials and a way for large companies to diversify their portfolios. In our breakout rooms today, uh, you'll hear from two representatives from these companies, um, and they'll talk about the work they've done with small technology uh, companies and what you can expect if you work with them. Uh, Rob Cumming uh, has been with Lafarge for 20 years and is very familiar with CCUS Technologies and the very successful project CO2 Mint um, with the uh, Richmond Cement Plant uh, in the Greater Vancouver area. Bree Fox has been with Capital Power for 15 years. Capital Power has ambitious plans to become carbon net neutral by 2050, and Bree will share uh, with you some of the technologies they are testing at the Genesee Carbon Conversion Center to reach that goal. Uh, we also have a, a one more breakout room with myself and Stephen Wilson from Foresight, uh, the Vice President of Acceleration, uh, to discuss how Canada is uniquely situated with facilities, experts, and services it can provide to technology developers from ideas to commercialization. Um, we're going to talk about how we can uh, bring that together to create uh, integrated solutions that we can export around the world. Um, I'd now like to invite all participants to select their breakout rooms and to connect with these industry leaders to learn more. Um, please select the breakout room you'd like to join. There should be icons at, at the bottom of your screen, and uh, that should allow you to self-select into those break, uh, breakout rooms. Um, and if, if not, uh, we will um, be able to uh, help, help you do that manually if you're having challenges. I see people are slowly coming back um, just, uh, you know, on behalf of, of myself and the Foresight team and the opportunity to continue our collaboration with CMC Research. Uh, we hope you've enjoyed this session today. Obviously, with a report of this magnitude, there's going to be a lot to unpack. And, uh, and we're here to, to support that process with all of you. This is, as many of the speakers and comments have been made, this is about collaboration and connectivity. And um, there's great opportunities, but there's also some hurdles that we need to overcome together to get there to, again, work on that positioning of Canada um, as a global leader in CCUS uh, innovation and, and ventures and technologies. So Stephen, thank you for, for working with us and, and, uh, and look forward to hearing your closing remarks. Back to you. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, uh, Jeanette. Uh, again, 
thanks to uh, the whole team who worked on this together uh, and to our partners at Global Affairs Canada uh, going forward. Uh, found very, very useful, uh, everything from uh, Martha's uh, comments at the beginning, uh, the breakout sessions, uh, getting some of the feedback. Uh, certainly, we will be continuing to work together with Foresight on a number of the ideas that we've heard about here and would invite all the participants. Uh, we're going to take the, what we've heard in our breakout sessions in the chat, but we'll also take forward any other comments you might want to send to us in terms of what next steps are. I know we're working with Global Affairs Canada on a number of interesting going forward events with them. I will say we had a, a great event um, last week, which uh, which Rachel hosted at the uh, at the embassy in Paris. Uh, we highlighted eight Canadian uh, CCUS companies at various stages. Some that are are well established, working with some European countries companies, and others that are fairly new. Uh, I think we had forty. French companies attending that session. So we want to be doing more and more of these. And uh, so working with you, getting input from the companies that are interested, um, we'll, we'd like your input and where to move forward on that. And again, uh, we really appreciate the partnership that we've had with Global Affairs Canada. And, uh, and again, I think one of the other things uh, uh, Martha Hall Finley was able to sort out is, is how do we continue to work better with some of the major emitters who are also at the other side of that equation on the demand side? So, so that's certainly one of our focuses there to, uh, to, to work with them, uh, both on the policy side, but also connecting larger companies with, with many that are in the CCUS uh, um, supply chain from startups to much larger companies. Anyway, thank you very much everybody for attending. I hope you found it uh, valuable and any ideas for next steps or uh, next event to make it, uh, make it a, a better event next time. We'd look forward to that. Also any input on how we should refresh this, uh, this work on a, on a regular basis. Um, let us know what you need and we'll see if we can make it work. Thanks again. Thanks everyone. Bye now.